Trina Michaels. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman, and ladies of the gentlemen of the committee for sitting aside this time to hear all of us. Hello, my name is Katrina Michaelis. I'm born, raised, and a State University educated native. 60 years ago, my adoptive parents fought to have white placed on my birth certificate. Listed, as, listed this way because of the prevailing pre uh, prejudices and hatred against Asians. As you can see, I am not white. So I am protected against discrimination because I'm white, because I'm white and because I'm a female, but I am not protected because I am gay. Idaho's discrimination against LBGTA dictates where we have our place of employment, where we live, who we love, where we die, and where we are buried. Raised in a loving and Christian Republican home, my civic duty was a daily occurrence. It has been mentioned about a gay agenda. Seriously, Proposition 1 was a direct assault on the LBGTA community. The gay agenda was simply to protect what little freedoms and rights we had at the time. Prop 1 also spurred me to action. I participated in both recent mar marches in Washington. I had the privilege of carrying our flag, our state flag, up on the stage. And I've also spoke on these very capital state steps. I've also been head of the large gay and, um, gay and lesbian community in the state of Idaho. And as um, secretary uh, treasurer for the decline to sign, I have had death, threat, death threats. Okay, it does happen. Discrimination is not something that is minimal in the state of Idaho. My childhood dream was to become a teacher, so I pursued a Bachelor of Science um, in Education. While doing so, my student teaching, I witnessed many lives, relationships, and families destroyed by the Boise 7 incident. Friends, especially teachers, lived in fear of losing their jobs, their homes, and well-being just because of their sexual orientation. Sadly, 38 years later, they still live in fear. It has nothing to do with their job performance. It has everything to do with their personal lives. I knew back then that I could never teach for a state agency that could just toss me out for being a lesbian. I am a not a second class citizen. I work in the private sector now. I miss not being a teacher. 30 seconds remaining. Despite the Bill of Rights guaranteeing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and in many states these basic rights are not inclusive. Our great nation was built on the premise of freedom. Our forefathers and present-day servicemen and women have or may pay the ultimate price for our freedoms without exception. They have not, nor will they ever go into battle listing exclusions of freedom that they are not fighting for. I wholly believe that adding the words, these four words, guarantee freedom. I believe the in the separation of church and state, okay? The timer, the timer has sounded, okay, so thank please you. wrap it up. I urge you to vote yes on, pro on this um, House Bill 2. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you. Alicia Clegg, Steve Martin. Let me get some others up on deck. Joan Kaufman. Reverend Deborah Graham, Beverly Hines, Esteban Gillian, something like that anyway, Andrew Stone, Ian Dot. Go ahead. Um, chairman and members of the uh, State Affairs Committee, my name is Alicia Clegg and I want to thank you for having this hearing. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of House Bill 2. I live in Boise, but was born and raised in a big, tight-knit Mormon family in Blackfoot, Idaho. My dad works out at the INEL, and my mom has gone from being a stay-at-home mom to teaching and directing the GED program at a technical college now that my four siblings and I are grown and out of the house. We're all adults now, and my family is still pretty tight-knit, but our relationships with each other have had to grow throughout the years. They had to grow when my sister married my brother-in-law, and they had to grow to include my nieces and nephews, of which there are five now. They had to grow as my siblings and I have moved to different towns for, and states for jobs and spouses and schools. They had to grow when I told my family that I'm gay, and when my brother brought his husband home to celebrate Christmas with us for the first time. As a gay Idahoan, I have different everyday experiences than my straight siblings do. I have the same concerns when I go to work every day that my sister or my brother do. I worry about doing a good job. 
I worry about being able to lead my team effectively. I worry about keeping on top of emails and contributing meetings and delivering service that keeps our clients happy. Unlike my sister or my brother, though, I've also worried about my haircut speaking louder than my ideas. I've worried that wearing a tie to work will overshadow my experience in my field. I've worried that using the wrong pronoun for a romantic partner in a casual conversation with a team member or with my boss will distract from the job that I'm doing. When I've chosen to keep myself in the closet at work, I've worried about keeping my stories straight and have felt guilty when lying about my personal life in casual conversation. When I've chosen to be out of work, I've worried that my orientation will matter more to my employer than the job that I do. Um, these worries mean that if I didn't live in Boise in a protected a city with a non-discrimination ordinance, I wouldn't be testifying before you today. Really, all that I want to devote mental, mental energy to is whether the way I'm going about the job we're working on for a county clerk's office will allow them to quickly and easily find information in their database. I'm testifying today because I know that what keeps my family together and allows our relationships to grow is also what will keep our state strong. My family knows that what matters most at the end of the day is not that one of my brothers is a libertarian and my dad is a Republican and I'm a Democrat. It's not that my parents and I attend different churches now. It's not that my sister teaches music and directs her school musical every 30 year. 30 seconds remaining. Um, many Idahoans, including myself, are gay or transgender individuals, and many Idahoans are not. What matters most is how we treat each other in passing House Bill 2 is about ensuring that each Idahoan has the freedom to go about their lives in peace. I strongly urge you to vote for House Bill 2. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you. Steve Martin. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. My name is Steve Martin. I live in Boise and I've lived in Idaho for more than 30 years. Thank you for taking the time to hear our testimonies these last few days. I'm here in support of House Bill 2. I'm a gay man and I feel the need to emphasize that I did not choose to be gay. I was born this way. The only choice I made was to accept it, embrace it, and understand that being gay is just another wonderful part of who I am. And I'm really glad that I did. If I hadn't, I likely never would have met my husband, Jim Smith, who I've shared a loving and fulfilling life with in Boise for nearly 20 years. I can tell you that growing up gay in Idaho, much of that time living in Caldwell was difficult. I was always afraid for my safety, afraid of losing work, afraid of being thrown out of apartments if a landlord found out I was dating a man, afraid that my husband could be barred from visiting me in the hospital if I were critically ill or dying. I'm also here representing Pride Foundation, a 30-year-old Northwest-based foundation that provides community grants and academic scholarships to organizations and students promoting and striving for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equality. As the community organizer here in Idaho for Pride Foundation, I can tell you that in my outreach and advocacy work around the state, I have met countless numbers of LGBT people who face discrimination every day in housing, employment, and public accommodations. Many would not dare to come testify before you today due to fear of losing their jobs and their livelihoods. I've read many, too many, scholarship applications from LGBT youth who have been disowned and left homeless by their parents simply because they were gay or transgender. You as our state leaders need to pass this bill to send the message that discrimination in any form towards anyone is wrong. A statewide bill is crucial to ensure universal and equal protections for all LGBT Idahoans. All of us deserve the opportunity to earn a living to provide for ourselves and our families without fear of being fired being denied housing or refused service by a business simply because of who we are. I urge you to pass House Bill 2 to amend the Human Rights Act in Idaho to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Add me, add Jim, add us, add the words, no more, no less. Not only is the right thing to do, it is the human thing to do. We all deserve the right to live our lives openly, safely, and genuinely. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. My, my assistant is having a hard time with the timer. <laughs> <laughs>
technology is not some of our fortes here. <laughs> jo Joan Kaufman, followed by Reverend Deborah Graham, Beverly Hines will be after that. Thank you. My name is Joan Kaufman and I live in Caldwell. I'm here as a straight ally for Add the Words. Like many of you, I've tried to live by the golden rule and did not realize that everyone in Idaho is not treated fairly or equally and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm sad to say I've witnessed discrimination in the job place. Back in the early 2000s, I worked for Canyon County and was on the interview panel seeking to find the best person for an opening in our office. The candidates had taken a clerical skills test to narrow it down to the top finalists. We, along with our supervisor, unanimously picked a young lady that we felt would be the perfect fit for our office and working with the public. Imagine our surprise when our supervisor's boss overrode our decision. His reason? He thought she played in a lady softball league and he said, you know, female softball players are gay. He didn't think it would be a good thing for our office. He didn't even have proof. And how could that possibly affect our office? We had all felt she was the best fit for our office and the most qualified. Unfortunately, as is the case in a lot of these situations, and I was guilty, although we were shocked and mad about it, we did not say anything for fear of losing our jobs. The straight people are also affected. I'm still fearful today. Someone asked if I would say this to the paper and give my name. I said, no, he's still working there. We're afraid. And uh, other people will say the same thing. And now this has become more personal to me. I have a pretty typical daughter. By that I mean she sounds pretty much like your daughters and granddaughters that we've been hearing about. T-ball, softball, piano voice lessons. Uh, when she was young, uh, we used to come home to Idaho to my parents' farm, play in the sandy dirt in Central Cove, where she, uh, we eventually moved back to. Um, she had a gentle heart for all creatures, still does. Uh, and enjoyed meeting the animals one time down at Gail's parents' farm. She was in 4-H five years, marching band, homecoming dances. I'm saying these things, full ride to academic ride to um, college, started out Hollywood video just like typical kids. After college, just like the young man, she, uh, at the age of 25, uh, all on her own, uh, funding and everything, bought a house. A couple years ago, she came out to me, and my heart froze, not for who she was. She was still all those wonderful qualities and a very accomplished young lady. But I feared for how this would affect her future life and career in Idaho. And it, you have no idea how much it hurt yesterday to have pe Thank you. You have no idea how much it hurt yesterday to have a couple people lump her with pedophiles. Uh, I had, but I feared for how this would affect her future life and career in Idaho. I would never want her to also face the job discrimination that I was privy to at Canyon County. I'm very proud to support Add the Words, and please add my daughter Carolyn. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you very much. Reverend Deborah Graham. I come bearing gifts. Um, documents that show the bar bar bipartisan support for this uh, bill and also um, other documentation. My name, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is the Reverend Deborah Graham. I'm an Episcopal priest. I speak for myself and a number of my parishioners. I am a second generation Idaho citizen, born in Boise in 1955. I currently live in Boise and I have lived in Moscow, Blackfoot, Pocatello, Nampa, Garden City. I currently serve churches in Payette and Weezer. I also have served churches in Nampa and Meridian. I know Idaho and I love Idaho. Mr. Chairman, I was raised a devout Christian. When my sexuality became conscious, I was horrified. I felt I had to choose between being gay and being myself, between God and being gay. I had to choose between God and being myself, being God and being gay. I chose God and sank into severe depression and emotional pain. I hated myself. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. At one point, I had a gun in my hand ready to put it to my head and pull the trigger. But somehow, by God's grace, I found the strength to put the gun down and return it to its owner, 
who ironically had given it to me to protect me from a man who was breaking into single women's apartments in Pocatello, where I lived at the time. I went through three years of great emotional suffering, finally through theology classes from the Catholic Diocese of Boise. I was Catholic at the time. In much prayer, I was able to hear God speaking in my heart and mind that my sexuality was okay and God would be with me through the difficulties I knew I would face. As an Episcopal priest, I have listened to parishioners living in Nampa and in Cogwa who speak to me of young teens who have, they know, who have committed suicide and the pain that brings into their hearts. Other parishioners have transgender family members for whom they are quite concerned for their safety and well-being, and they have reason to concern, for concern. A well-documented study by the Williams Institute, which I provide copies for everyone here, University of California School of Law documents the fact that LBGT people experienced discrimination in Idaho. Briefly, here is one, one of the findings of the survey. A 2003 survey showed that more than 2,000 Idahoans, of more than 2,000 Idahoans, found that 16% of transgender respondents, 12% of gay and bisexual men. 30 seconds and eight, remaining. Okay. Uh, uh, were told that by their employer they've been fired from their job. Sir, uh, First John says that there's no fear in love, and perfect love casts out fear. But as Martin Luther King said, law cannot make a man love me. The law, however, can and does create safe spaces where we can have conversations with one another to come to know and understand each other, heal our fears, and come together to find the way to fulfill the words of the prophet Micah. Everyone will sit on their vine and fig tree. No one will make them afraid, says the Lord Almighty. For these reasons and more, I ask you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee members to vote yes for House Bill 2. My full written testimony is here, and I ask that it would be put into the record. Thank you. It will be done. Are there questions? Representative Wintrow. Mr. Chair, Reverend Graham, thank you very much. Um, could you please just briefly share the survey with me? You ran through the statistics. I didn't hear the survey name or just the numbers. Could you just please quickly do that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Representative, uh, this is the employment and housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in Idaho by the William Institute from the University of California Law School, published May 2014. And the and just the statistics you were you were excuse me, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Wintrow. Reverend Let me Graham. Read to you again. This is one of the findings, and this is an 18-page document with five pages of footnotes. A 2003 survey of more than 2,000 Idahoans found that 16% of transgender respondents, 12% of gay and bisexual men, and 8% of gay and bisexual women were expressly told by their employer that they had been fired from a job, not promoted, or had not received compensation or a raise because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. More than half of the LBGT respondents felt they had to hide or deny their sexual orientation or gender identity in the workplace." End quote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Thank you. And thank you for your time, sir. Beverly Hines, Esteban, Ilian, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to mess that one up. Andrew Stone, Ian Dot, Laura Volkert, Michael Bishop, no takers. Jerry, Jerry E. Britta, is it? I didn't want to testify anyway. Emily Siraki Van House.
Andrew Van Hise. Reverend Robert Spencer. Um, Sterling Mortensen. Aaron Abbott. Mr. Chair, uh, Sterling Mortensen was going to be here this morning. He should have been here by now. He, he's expected to be here. We, we might give him a, a chance later if he gets here. Could you, could you let us know when that happens? Thank you. Emily, please put this in the record correctly, would you? Okay, it's um, Emily Siraki Van Hise. Well, <laughs> Does that help you? Well, <laughs> Is that I, what you mean? I, I, I really blew that one. Okay. No, um, but I will. I'll, Sorry I'll print that. it out for you. So uh, that's good. you know, with a name like mine, uh, I, I, yeah. I understand yes, your. I understand yes. your plight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandmother's maiden name was Vipieski, so when she got the name Siraki, she thought that was really simple. So that's good. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee, my name is uh, Emily Siraki Van Heys. I'm a resident of East Boise, and I'm the canon pastor of St. Michael's Episcopal Cathedral, just across the street from the State House. I'm here to urge you to vote yes on House Bill 2, to add the words sexual orientation and gender identity to our existing Human Rights Act. I speak to you as a citizen of this state and as a priest of the Episcopal Church. At my baptism, my parents committed to raising me within the Christian faith. They committed to continue in the teachings of the Bible, to participate in the worship and the fellowship of the church. They acknowledged that when they fell into sin, they could repent and be forgiven. They committed to seek and serve Christ in all persons, to love their neighbors as themselves. They promised to strive for justice and peace and to respect the dignity of every human being. They fulfilled their commitment. And when I was of age, I made these same promises myself to seek and serve Christ in all persons, to respect the dignity of every human being. Every single Episcopalian makes these promises over and over. Each time another person is baptized, confirmed, or received into the church, and several times a year at Holy Day services. Now in the Episcopal Church, and as in other Christian denominations, we've had our shares of disagreement. We've been in the New York Times. It's been very exciting. We've struggled to maintain unity, but never, never have we wavered on this baptismal covenant, which along with the apostles and the Nicene creeds creates the stable base for our faith. Never have we argued or disagreed on any of these commitments. This week, we've heard opponents of this bill state that we do not need to add the words to our Human Rights Act. But I've not heard one person say that we do not need the Human Rights Act itself. Of course, we know that we can't legislate kindness and love, but we can pass legislation that tells the citizens of our state on no uncertain terms that we in Idaho will not stand for treating any of our citizens or even any of our visitors with anything less than the dignity and respect Christ showed each and every person that he encountered. About 30 seconds. The addition of these four words to our existing Human Rights Act will not legislate the values of the church, as was stated by the Attorney General in a statement. It will not legislate the values any parent teaches their children unless these values are based on violence and isolation which hurt other citizens. The addition of these words to our Human Rights Act will make it safer for our children and all vulnerable people to call on their neighbors and law enforcement for help when they're afraid or abused it will enable more Idahoans to make an honest living, find housing, and help to free them from the fear, shame, and isolation that lead to destructive behaviors, including suicide. In this legislation, please, legislative please session, wrap it up. You're, the okay, time's this last sentence, you have the opportunity to demonstrate that Idahoans recognize and will stand up for the dignity and well-being of every human being. Thank you. I urge you to vote yes on House Bill 2. Are there questions? Thank you very much. Andrew Van Heys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, 
thank you for sitting through these long hearings and holding them. I'll keep my comments brief and, and mostly to the point. My name is Andrew Van Heis, and I've been a resident of Idaho for four, maybe five months now. In August, my wife and I married, and we moved here to Boise. I, I've learned to call it Boise. Um, we moved here to Boise to follow my wife's employment and her ministry. The first thing I want to say is how much we love it here. I know you all hear this a, a lot, but with hardly an exception, each person we've met here in Idaho has been warm, welcoming, and respectful. And I'm appreciative that even in as divisive and passionate <clears throat> a discussion as this, participants on both sides have been, of the debate have been respectful of one another. The perspective I want to bring here to this conversation is one of a businessman who has been on Wall Street his entire career and is now deciding whether to move his small investment business to Boise. Either I lease office space, hire a staff, contract with service providers here, and create Idaho jobs, or I commute to New York, Seattle, or the Bay Area. My business is small compared to some larger enterprises that might consider moving to this state but I imagine my concerns are shared by decision makers at some larger companies. And what I care about beyond questions of market and resources is what is that in Idaho, commerce is fluid and free of excess regulation and social bias. I understand the fears expressed in earlier testimony by a couple of business owners. In fact, one of the greatest expenses for investment firms is regulatory compliance. But HP02 is not an increase in my regulatory burden. Rather, the codified civil rights protections of Idaho law are reassurance that the Idaho firms with which I do business hire the best people for the job without regard to religion, national origin, or sexual orientation, or gender identity. And my own clients can have the same confidence that my employment decisions and my investment advice are centered around their best interests and not my social opinions or religious beliefs. In earlier testimony, we heard, quote, you can't legislate kindness. This bill does not pretend to do that, but in its protections it puts forward respect for human dignity of others as a foundation for commercial interaction. And it's on this foundation that I can train and mentor my employees and expect from them the best that they can give. And similarly on this foundation, I can build a commercial relationship with my clients and my business counterparties. It's not in my experience to be able to speak to the anguish of discrimination, and I'll leave it to others to argue the moral and ethical issues. 30 seconds. Thank you. The concern I'm voicing today is purely mercenary, and in that voice I can say, by passing HB02, you send the message that in Idaho, the business of business is quite simply business. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you. Reverend Robert Spencer, then Sterling, Sterling Mortensen, Aaron Abbott, Ben Butterworth, Bill Bath, Clay Gill. Go ahead. Good morning. Mr. Chairman and members of Would the... Please state your name for the record. Oh, Robert Spencer, living in Eagle, Idaho. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, two words have surfaced in these hearings that have concerned for me. One is fear and the other is change. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I like change. I'm not sure it's easy to live with, but sometimes change is a good thing. And it seems as though the older I get, the easier it is to understand and accept that change. <clears throat> The fear, all of us fear uh, something in our lives. All of us have lived with different types of fear. Uh, I can remember back in the Vietnam era, the fear of the draft. Many of the folks here recognize that, many don't. I also recognize the fear of living as a gay man and a gay priest. And yes, you saw, you've seen three gay clergy from the Episcopal Church, but we do have a lot of straight clergy also. <laughs> and I would affirm everything that my associate Emily has said. As an ordained priest for 43 years and time 
part of that time in parish ministry and part of that time as a hospital chaplain, working with people who come from all different backgrounds and areas. The Episcopal Church has struggled with the issues of homosexuality and transgendered. It has struggled with this for many years. The Episcopal Church has a history of studying things, and we have studied all of these issues for at least 10 to 12 years. We've arrived at a place where we've accepted in the Episcopal Church gay and lesbian and transgendered folks to be ministers, to be bishops, to be priests, to be deacons in the church. And we've arrived at even being able to bless unions between same gender couples. So it's been a long, hard journey. I came out in my 40s, and it came out after I moved to Idaho because I felt more accepted here than I did in the southeast of this country. So we do have that history behind us. Each of us who have stood here before you have the history behind us also. You have about 30 seconds left. You're asking a preacher to cut I know. Back. I know. <laughs> well, then I would just close by saying that I really do support the four words. I hope that House Bill 2 will pass through this committee and eventually through the House of this great state. Thank you. If you think it's bad for preachers, it's terrible for politicians to, <laughs> I know. to, to uh, remain silent. Are there questions? <laughs>